Woo-wee, was that some wild, weird singing or what? So I'm gonna tell you what I was doing, but first I should introduce myself. You don't know who I am and I don't know who you are, but my name is Mark Shepard and I am a singer, songwriter, drummer, percussionist, storyteller type guy. I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to describe myself to you. I just, I've always been insatiably curious about other cultures and music and nature. And I love, I love making music and telling stories and I'm working on building a farm. And so it all for me ties together in a curiosity. And I hope as we go through this program today, the program is called Beneath the Northern Star, and it's drum songs and stories about Northern cultures. I hope you will hold in your heart, in your mind, in your body, a sense of curiosity about other people who might live in a different way than you and I, but who basically are like you and I. So first, let me talk about this weird singing I was doing, and then I'm gonna introduce the program and set up, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell basically three stories, a really big one, and then a funny one, and then a story that I've actually turned into a song. So, buckle your seat belts, relax, take a deep breath, here we go. Boom. So uh, I want to just real quick before we get into the stories, I wanted to explain this kind of strange singing I was doing. Uh, some of it was overtone singing where I can actually sing more than one note at a time. And I wanted to come outside and, and to not demonstrate it in a studio setting um, so you can hear the, the raw voice. And I did a bunch of cool stuff in my studio <laughs> too. I used, I had a delay and I made myself sing in like a, a cathedral with reverb and that was fun. But the, the basic thing is when we talk and when we sing, we create overtones and um, we don't normally emphasize them when we talk. So um, let's see if I can... <coughs> Uh, and you you want to try this in the shower so you can really hear yourself. And please don't do it in class to annoy people, okay? I want the teachers to like me. <laughs> so, but when you sing the word hero really slowly, it makes overtones. So here we go. Hero. I did a real low, what I call undertones, which is a style that they sing in Central Asia, Siberia, Mongolia, and that area. But ah, I got so much to tell you. Uh, I'm so excited about this. I'm, I'm, I'm a music nerd. <laughs> so I did some African style yodeling in there. Uh, the, the drum is a, is a very large frame drum. It's actually an Irish Bowron but it was made in Pakistan. So it's really a world drum. And it's very similar to drums they use in Siberia. So, and it's a little thicker, but the same size as drums used by the Eskimos, the Inuit. I was doing overtone singing. I was doing African style yodeling. And I was doing something ca called throat whistling. And I don't know where throat whistling is from. Um, one day I just heaved a big sigh because my kids were driving me nuts. And <clears throat> it whistled in my throat. So I practiced it and it's really cool through the digital delay. So I think that's, that's, that's enough of an introduction to what I just did. Now I'm gonna do a very serious introduction to put the two stories, the big stories I'm gonna tell you into perspective. And they're pretty serious stories 
and they're deep. So I'm going to, in the middle, I'm going to share a funny story from Scandinavia. So stay tuned and uh, here we go. Boom. So I want to tell you the story, a story from the Inuit people who we've, we've called Eskimos, but that's not what they call themselves. So we're going to call them Inuit. That is the name they call themselves. So part of learning about other cultures and telling stories and folk tales and, and understanding other cultures is to realize that ultimately we're all alike, even though we may look different, even though we may live very differently. And the people of the North from Ireland to Scandinavia to Siberia to the Inuit people of Alaska and Greenland and Northern Canada. Northern people had to solve some of the biggest challenges of how do you stay warm in the winter and how do you eat in the winter when often food was scarce. And so the, the Inuit people developed a technology based on whale hunting and because they didn't have wood so they made lots of things out of whale bones, whale baleen, and they developed the kayak, which everybody knows today. Uh, everybody paddles in a kayak, right? And they would stretch uh, skins over a frame, and either the frame was wood that they got, you know, by traveling as far south as they could, to where forests began because in the Inuit lands, uh, a lot of it was just uh, tundra. There were no trees. So wood was very precious, but you could build a, a skeleton like a frame out of wood and stretch skins over it. And the, the Inuit would hunt from their kayaks and they, they had large ones and they had small ones. In the in Ireland, the stories are of silkies, seals that can turn into humans. In the Eskimo or the Inuit tradition, there are also seals that can transform into humans. There's birds that can transform into human humans. We call them shapeshifters in the storytelling world. And so these are the two kind of pillars of my program. The Land of the Birds, which is an Inuit story, uh, which I'm going to begin with, and then I'm going to end with the Silky, which I've actually turned into a song as well as a spoken story. So make yourself comfortable and take a few deep breaths. We're going to use our imaginations and we're going to explore the land of the north, beneath the northern star. There is a star called Polaris, which is in today's world, because the stars do change eventually, but it is a star that is directly over the North Pole. And anyone who knows this star in the northern hemisphere can, can steer a ship by it and find their way home. So. Today, we're going to tell some stories from beneath the northern star. The land of the birds. There was a young hunter. And the young hunter was lonely, and it was time for him to find a wife. But he lived far away from other people. He lived mostly alone which was unusual in the far north, but he was such a good hunter and he was so good at hunting that he was always able to find food. And he sewed his own clothes with a, a bone needle and sinew for thread. They didn't look that good, but they kept him warm. But he was lonely and he was out hunting one day and he was just thinking about how lonely he was when he heard a strange sound, it sounded almost like women talking, chattering. He 
paused. And then he began to follow the sound of the women talking. And the sound led him up a hill. And as he approached the crest of the hill, he slowed down and he got very low and he just peeked through some tall grasses for it was a summer. This is a summer story. <laughs> Looked through and he saw a lake, a beautiful, clear lake, kind of in a bowl shaped depression surrounded by this hill. If you can imagine an ancient extinct volcano, that's kind of what it, what it looked like. The, the slope was very gentle and the women were swimming, they were bathing and all along the shore were their cloaks, feather cloaks, for they were shapeshifters. And he thought, ah, look at all these women. <laughs> it's like, this is, this is better than dating online. And he, so he leapt out of his hiding place and he ran down and he grabbed one of the feather cloaks and all the women rushed out of the water, grabbed their feather cloaks, wrapped them around themselves, turned into snow geese and flew away. All except for one. And she stood there, quite embarrassed, and she said, can, can I have my feather cloak? Please give me my feather cloak. He said, no, you have to marry me. I don't want to marry you. I don't even know you. <laughs> I want my feather cloak. Please give it back. And he said, no. What else was she going to do? She had no clothing and he wouldn't give it to her. And he actually rolled it up and he put it in his, his pack and he gave her a blanket. Here, you can wear this. And then she had to go with him. There was no choice in the matter. And today in our culture, one of the things that is happening in our culture has been happening for the last 100 years is that women have said, hey, you can't just take us. We are human beings with rights. You have to ask us. <laughs> but these stories tell a lot of important things and, and how this was wrong. Even hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, it was wrong. And the early cultures taught their lessons by telling these stories. So the woman had to follow him and it was not the best way to start a marriage. Just like with the Irish silky stories, usually they weren't happy marriages where the silky had to stay on land because a fisherman had stolen her seal skin. So in this story, she began to walk along the beach gathering feathers and eventually she had children she had twins a boy and a girl and she would gather feathers with them almost every day and whenever the hunter was away she would work on making them feather cloaks so they could escape and eventually the cloaks were done and the hunter was away and she wrapped her children each in their own feathered cloak and she put hers on that she had made. And they turned into snow geese. And they flew up into the air, the children following their mother. And she made a circle around, she made a circle around where they were and then flew towards the land of the birds where she had come from so many years ago. And as they flew, eventually they flew over the hunter and he looked up and the children called down, Father, we're going to the land of the birds. Probably the last thing the mother wanted him to know because she was trying to get away from him. But they flew on to the land of the birds and the hunter was left realizing again that loneliness and realizing that perhaps he had not connected the right way with this amazing woman, this magical being from the land of the birds. And so he began to follow. Now, if I were writing the story, I'd have him go home. 
I'd have him find the feather cloak that he had taken from her, and I'd have him put it on, (laughs) and I'd have him fly after her. But I didn't write the story. So he begins to follow, and he follows and he follows. I don't know how many days he followed, but it was a long time. And eventually he came to a strange sight. It was a, a large pot of meat just bubbling away in the middle of nowhere. Strange, he thought. It must be a trap. He tried to go around it, but the pot moved and blocked his way. When he went to the right, it moved to the right. He went to the left, it moved to the left. And so he eventually thought, huh, maybe if I leap over it. But it was hot. What if I fall in? I'll be boiled. But he had to try, so he backed up. And he ran as hard as he could, and he leapt up, and he just managed to use the edge of the pot as a stepping stone, a, a, a step, and he leapt up into the air, and at the same time, he was able to grab a piece of meat with his hand. <laughs> and he landed on the other side of the pot, and he kept running, and the pot stayed where it was. He had passed the first test. Now, in stories all over the world, there's always tests. And in our lives, there are always tests. So be aware, stories again, not factual, but they speak true things to us as humans. So he kept going and eventually, he put the the meat in his pack, (laughs) might need it. And eventually there were two large gray wolves who blocked his path and growled at him. He tried to go around them, but they blocked his way. He tried to go around them the other way. They blocked his way. And eventually he thought, oh, the meat. So he reached into his pack and he pulled out this chunk of meat. And he said, here, Wolfie, Wolfie. And he tossed it. (laughs) And the wolves... They were wolves after all, were distracted and they went after the meat. And so our hero, if he is a hero, (laughs) our man, the main character of our story was able to run on and he kept going and he kept going and he kept going, going. Eventually came to a, a place where there were two huge rocks and he started to go between them, but the rocks rumbled and closed and blocked his path. So he tried to go around them to the left and the rocks rumbled and blocked his path. And he tried to go around to the other side and the rocks rumbled and blocked his path. And so he did not know what to do. So he waited and he watched and he waited and he watched. And then suddenly with no warning, he ran in between the rocks and the rocks crushed back together and if I was writing the story I'd have the rocks squash him but he managed to get through he managed to get through and he kept going and kept going and he kept going until he eventually came to a lake and there by the shore of the lake was a man named Little Salmon and Little Salmon was chopping wood with a hatchet and the chips of wood were flying up into the air and then landing in the water and swimming away as salmon. And so the man said to little salmon, have you seen my wife and children? Did they fly over on the way to the land of the birds? And the little salmon said, yes, I saw them quite a, quite a bit ago. And the man was like, I want to go to the land of the birds. Can you help me? Well, little salmon said, I don't know if I can help you or not. Have you changed your way of thinking? Because I can't send you to the land of the birds and have you be cruel to your wife. I can't have you owning her. She's not a thing. The man said, no. I feel differently now. I realize it was a mistake. 
and that I love her and I miss my children and I want to support them and protect them and teach them, teach them the things that I've learned from these hard lessons. And so Little Salmon said, okay then, I will help you. And he gave the man a skeleton. And he said this, when you put it in the water, it was a fish skeleton. When you put it in the water, it will turn into a kayak. But it's a magical kayak and it will only take you to the land of the birds if you keep your eyes closed. If you open them, it will turn back into a fish skeleton and you will drown. And the man understood and he said, I'm willing. So little salmon put the fish skeleton in the water and it turned instantly into a kayak. The man climbed on and closed his eyes and the kayak began to move. He couldn't really feel the movement, but he could hear the water and the wind and the waves. And it took so long. It was a huge lake and the island was far, far out in the middle of the lake. And he does not know how long it took and he wanted to open his eyes just to peek. He wanted to open his eyes so badly, but he wanted his children and his wife even more and he was willing he was willing to wait willing willing to wait but eventually his curiosity got so so strong that he started to peek and he could feel the boat shudder and start to turn away from being a kayak and he closed his eyes really quick until eventually the boat nudged against the shore and he opened his eyes and climbed off the boat which instantly turned back into a fish skeleton and there were his children playing on the beach father they were happy to see him he'd tried to be a good father they weren't afraid of him he wasn't mean he just didn't understand certain things that hopefully you'll understand after the story and he said children I have come such a long way. I want, I want to support you and take care of you and teach you the things I know and the lessons that I've learned. And they hugged him and he said, I, where's your mother? And so they pointed up to this little, little dwelling. And so he went and knocked on the door and she saw that it was him and she went out the back door and she went to the other side of the island, but he followed her. And then she went to the, other side of the island and he followed her there and eventually said please please wait I need to apologize I've learned my lesson I was wrong I get it please forgive me I want to be your husband up to this point it was always she was his wife his possession but now he wanted to be her partner and I think that's a beautiful story and that is the story of the land of the birds. So is that a huge story or what? This portion of the program, by the way, has been brought to you by water. You know, kids, ever since I've been drinking water, I've been alive. Water, a good thing to drink. Now back to our program. Boom. All right, so I'm gonna attempt to tell a story while I walk because sometimes that's a really nice thing to do and it's a beautiful day and I want to get out of my basement studio and uh, <laughs> these are two stories that feature a foolish farmer and the first one is one that I found while I was looking for the second one because I had read the second one years and years ago and I, I always liked it and it's kind of 
it's very typical of stories that show up all around the world of a main character who seems foolish but he always ends up winning the day so i like these stories as someone who does things that normal people would consider to be foolish like making a living as a storyteller like you don't go to school for that right or starting a farm uh, <laughs> at my age <clears throat> and also today farmers have been so economically impacted that even to say you want to be a farmer people look at just strange so i like these two stories and i thought we could use a little bit of levity they're from scandinavia denmark norway sweden and uh, they show up pretty much everywhere else in the northern hemisphere so here we go the foolish farmer number one there was a foolish farmer and he decided to go to town to sell some butter. His mother wasn't too impressed, didn't think he could do it, because he wasn't very smart, according to her. So he headed to town, and he got, gets to town with the butter, and there's a rock with the name of the town painted on it. He thought that was the town. So he offers to sell the butter to the rock, and the rock didn't say anything, and the farmer said, to himself oh he must love my butter so he slathered the butter all over the rock and said to the rock i'll be back tomorrow and you can pay me then the rock of course didn't say anything so the farmer goes back home and tells his mother yeah i sold the uh, butter to a rock and tomorrow i'll collect payment she shook her head oh oh my son so the next day he goes to the rock and of course the rock didn't have any money because it was a rock and he said rock pay me for the butter that i gave you that i sold you and the rock didn't say anything so the farmer got mad and he went and got a pick and a shovel and one of those big metal pry bars and he started digging at the rock i'll show you i'll down and eventually he pushed the rock over on its side and underneath the rock was a pot of gold was the farmer, farmer foolish or just lucky? I don't know. So he goes back home and his mother is like, yeah, we'll see how long this lasts. <laughs> and then he takes the gold and he buys cows and pigs and sheep and goats and chickens. And he just, he really, he started a great farm, you know? So, uh, and eventually he needed to take some of the meat from one of his beef cattles cattles from one of his beeves one of his steers to town and so he heads to town and on the way to town he meets a pack of dogs and he sells the meat to the dogs and he says to the dogs tomorrow I will come back for payment and of course the same thing happens the next day he comes back the dogs are like woof we're dogs woof woof and uh so he gets angry at the dogs and he says, I'm taking you to the king's court. And so he goes to the king's court, but on the way to the king's court, first he has to pass the drawbridge and the, and the guards and the guards are like, what? Tell you what, farmer, we'll let you in if you'll give each of us half of your reward. And so the farmer said, well, of course, I'm generous, I'll share. And so he promised, guard number one half of his reward and guard number two half of his re reward and I don't know if you've ever paid any attention to math but two halves is a whole so anyway he goes in I guess he had the dogs too <laughs> so it was loud it was a mess and the king was like what is going on and so the farmer tells his story and the king looked at him strangely but the daughter, the king's daughter, was overhearing this and she was someone who had just never laughed. She was sad and the king had searched far and wide for somebody who could make his daughter laugh and he had promised the whole kingdom plus his daughter to anyone who could make his daughter laugh. No one could, but all of a sudden she heard this story and she started laughing and laughing and she couldn't stop laughing. She was enjoying it so much. And so the king said, well, son, Looks like uh, you've won my daughter in marriage. And the, the farmer was like, nah, no thanks, your majesty. What I would like is 60 lashes on my feet for my reward. 
60 lashes on your feet. What? Well, turns out he had promised the guards each 50% of his reward. And he told this to the king and the king thought, oh, maybe this guy's not so dumb after all. And that made the king's daughter laugh even more. And so each guard got 30 lashes on his feet. And then the foolish farmer turns to the king and says, now about your daughter. I'd, uh, I'd consider taking her off your hands, but uh, your majesty, what's in it for me? And that is the end of the story of the foolish farmer number one. Whew, all right, so foolish farmer number two. There was a foolish farmer and he was, he was a hardworking farmer. He just didn't seem to be too bright, but his wife loved him. She adored him and he adored her and they got along really well and just it was she was a wonderful woman because every time he'd come in from the farm or the field she'd just honor his hard work and just appreciate him and so he loved her and she loved him it was just great <laughs> and we have so many stories of unhappy marriages and silkies and snow geese that have been kind of forced to be married who didn't want to and so this is great to have a couple that just adore each other you know it's just great it's a wonderful thing so anyway he decided to go to town he took one of their their beef steers to town and tied a rope on it and started leading it down the road and he eventually came uh, met met a neighbor who had a horse and the neighbor said hey I'll trade you my horse for your steer so the farmer's like that seems cool so he trades for the horse and he heads keeps going to town. What's the difference? Horse? Steer? Yeah. So he goes along a little farther and eventually he meets somebody who has a pig. And so he trades the horse for the pig. And then he meets someone who has a goat. So he trades the pig for the goat. And then he meets someone who has a sheep. So he trades the goat for the sheep. And then he meets someone who has a chicken and he trades the sheep for a chicken. And then he trades the chicken for a rooster. And about this time, he finally gets to the town and he's hungry because he hasn't eaten all day. So he trades the rooster for a nice meal and he eats the meal. And after the meal, he's full, but he has nothing left. <laughs> so he starts heading home, but it's a long way to go home. And he ends up coming about halfway home and he, he stops at a friend's house, uh, a neighbor who's a half a day's away and he, meets him up and he says, Lars, I'd like to stay overnight. And he tells Lars the whole story. And the foolish farmer tells the whole story and Lars is like, my wife would be so mad at me if I did that, that I would have to sleep with the pigs. And, and our foolish farmer's like, oh no, my wife will be proud of me. She loves everything I do. And Lars was like, nah, I don't think so. I'm gonna pause because the car's coming. By the way, do you know why you walk facing traffic? So you can see it coming. But on a bike, you wanna ride with traffic because if you're going 10 miles an hour on a bike and a car's coming at you at 30 miles an hour and you happen to collide, that's 40 miles an hour. But if you're going with traffic at 10 miles an hour and a car bumps you going 30 miles an hour, then you, get stay there guys good boy then you only get hit at 20 miles an hour little math anyway back to the story so Lars was like I don't think my wife would put up with that one minute your wife is gonna be mad at you you're gonna have to sleep with the pigs tonight and the foolish farmer was like no my wife loves me she'll love this story so Lars says I bet you a hundred tallers or maybe they're tallers, I don't know, T-A-L-E-R-S, some kind of old Scandinavian money. And I guess it was a lot of money. And so the foolish farmer's like, well, come along tomorrow morning and you will you can hear when I tell my wife. And so the next morning, the, farmer, the foolish farmer and Lars set out and Lars waited behind the door while the foolish farmer went in and told his wife the whole story. And she was, that is the greatest story. I love that story. Oh, I'm so proud of you, husband. She gave him hugs and kisses. And, he, and then he goes, and 
come on in Lars and Lars comes in and Lars is like oh and he had to pay the foolish farmer $100 which turned out to be worth more than a cow a horse a pig a goat a sheep a chicken a rooster and a meal all in one and that is the story number two of the foolish farmer Scandinavian humor folks is pretty funny and it's a little of what we call droll So I hope you enjoyed that and hope the wind wasn't too bad. Here we go. Boom So isn't that a funny story? There's there's a story like that in almost every culture Which is kind of cool So this portion of the program has been brought to you by air, you know kids ever since I've been breathing air I've been Alive. Isn't it great to be alive? Mm. Now we're going to finish up with the silky. So I got to tell you the story before I sing the song. So here we go. So we have come so far. We have traveled through the Inuit lands with the land of the birds. We've visited Scandinavia with a couple of lighthearted, what we call trickster or fool stories. And we now are going to end with my favorite story of all time, the Silky. And in Ireland and Scotland, there are stories of the magical seals that come to the shore. They take off their seal skins and they're human underneath. And in Ireland and Scotland, if someone is different or strange or unusual, people will often kind of whisper, ah, from the Silkies his mother's grandmother's uncle married a silky or something like that. And these marriages were not usually very happy because the, and, and sometimes it's a, a man who captures a female silky and sometimes it's a woman who captures a male silky. But either way, they grab the seal skin, they either hide it or destroy it so the silky cannot go back to the sea. Whereas in the land of the birds, the main, the, the snow goose, the magical snow goose shapeshifter was able to make cloaks for herself and her children. And they were able to fly away. The silkies end up having to stay on land because they can't go back to the sea. Um, and so in this particular story, there's a, a fisherman. He's lonely. He sees a young woman dancing on the rocks and so he says, ah, could be, she's a silky. So he sneaks up behind her and sure enough, she's draped her sealskin over a rock and she's just enjoying being in human form because I don't know if you've ever seen a seal try to walk on land. They're pretty awkward on land. And to be able to have legs and to be able to dance and run must feel great for a silky. So he sneaks up behind her, grabs the sealskin, and he says, ah, Katya, now you have to be my wife. So she's, she begs him, please let me go. Please give me my seal skin back. He says, no. But in seven years, I'll let you have it back. Well, it turns out in seven years, if she doesn't get it back, she's going to dry up like dust on the wind and blow away. But she has no choice. So she marries him. And in the old days, women were not given a choice as to who to marry. They were, they, um, they experienced arranged marriages. So, and it was usually, particularly in the upper classes, it was done to consolidate power. So to free women from this is one of the wonderful things that's happened in the last hundred years. So if you're a girl or a woman, be grateful to be alive now. And if you're a man, or a boy realize that things have changed and women and men still need each other, but we need to be partners in our lives. So in the story, she goes back with the fisherman. They get married and eventually ha she has a baby boy and the baby boy is about six years old and she has told him of what's going to happen. She's told him, of 
her childhood in the sea and she's taught him about all the ocean animals, but she's also told him about the drier days yet to come. And she's every day, she, every year, she's a little bit less healthy. And the fisherman is, he's just kind of denying the whole thing. So the boy's about six years old and late one night, he hears a strange noise down by the beach. They live right on the coast. And so he goes down to the beach and there is Grandfather Seal. Grandfather Seal has managed to find her seal skin because the fisherman has tied a rock to it and thrown it into the sea because he wants to keep his wife. And in his mind, he may feel love for her, but he doesn't express it very well. <laughs> and she still feels trapped. And every day she's drying up a little bit, a little bit more every single day. So the boy goes down to the sea. Grandfather Seal brings the seal skin back and the boy takes it to his mother because it, he sort of has a choice in that if he doesn't take it to his mother, she won't go back to the sea, but she won't live. She's going to dry up and blow away like dust on the wind. So he, of course, gives her her silky back. She puts it on and once again, she is full of life. And to me... This story is about healthy masculinity and healthy femininity. It's about giving, even though you know, if you give something to that person, they may go off and leave you, but they will be alive. They will be healthy. And it's what I call bittersweet. It's sad because she's going to go back to the sea and he's going to miss her, but it's happy because she's going to live She's going to live and she comes back to visit and together they swim in the healing waves. And this story, there's so many different versions of it that I kind of took the best of my favorite versions and kind of combined them. And it just, it haunted me in such a wonderful way. And as a compulsive songwriter, all of this storytelling came after the songwriting. And so I had to write a song about it. And I recorded the song and I played the Irish low whistle as well as the Irish bow run in the song. <clears throat> and I want to share it with you and I want to thank you for being a great audience and thank you for being interested in other cultures and being open-minded to the fact that we can learn so much from these ancient stories that can cause our hearts to sing. So I give you now the silky. Once there was a fisherman on the salty sea Who felt so very alone That he dreamed of a wife who could keep him company And give to him a child and a happy home One northern summer day was paddling his way through the tiny islands not far from shore when what did he espy to his hunter's practiced eye but a maiden dancing on the rocks so wild and pure well the sun was in her eyes so he caught her by surprise after he had hidden her seal skin She was a silky a sea A magic creature of the sea Who sometimes come ashore To walk in human form Oh, 
to be a silky of the sea Oh, to be a magic creature swimming free Don't I know the secrets of the foam Oh, to love the ocean and to call it home She begged to be set free but he said, no, come with me In seven years your skin I will return So sadly she obeyed and turned her back upon the waves And took a path that led her towards an early grave In the passing of the days She gave birth to a babe human son with the web between his toes but she'd begun to fade and to wither all away a little more with every single passing day but she told the child tales of seals and fish and whales she taught him how to sing and play the drum she told him of the times when she was strong and fine She told him of the drier days that were to come And oh, to be a silky of the sea Oh, to be a magic creature swimming of the foam Oh, to love the ocean and to call it home Six years she'd struggled on Now she was almost gone And the fishermen grew silent and grim And still he did deny the quiet pleading in her eyes as he told himself that somehow she could change her mind And one night the child awoke To a strange unearthly note A sound from deep beneath the moonlit waves It was old grandfather Seal A legend now made real Calling to his home to bring his daughter the boy tripped in the sand Reaching out his hand Touched the softness of her lost seal skin The man had thrown it to the deep Hoping so his wife to keep But the spirit of the sea had washed it in again And oh, to be a silky of the sea Oh, to be a magic creature swimming free Don't I know the secrets of the foam Oh, to love the ocean and to call it home Well, the boy took it to her and she slipped into its fur once again her eyes were full of life She was a silky a sea And would have died if not set free She was never meant to be a human wife Well the boy began to cry As she slipped into the tide But he could not save her any other way certain moonlit nights he would sometimes catch her sight and then they'd swim together in the healing waves and oh to be a silky of the sea oh to be a magic creature swimming free oh, to know the 
secrets of the foam Oh, to love the ocean and turn all it home Wow, so we have been on quite an adventure. I want to thank you very much. And I want to thank the Somerville Elementary School for sponsoring this program. And I want to just thank all the teachers and the parents who work so hard to make sure that you kids get really quality programming that you can learn from, that you can be inspired by, and that perhaps you can take with you in your heart wherever you go for the rest of of your lives. My name is Mark Shepard. This has been Beneath a Northern Star. Drums, songs, and stories celebrating cultures of the far north. And I want to invite you, I'm going to make a little bonus for you of some of my sound effects instruments. So hopefully you will have a little extra time before the end of the school year or whenever you're watching this to learn a little bit about my obsession with with sound effects, instruments, and drums, and all that kind of thing. So, peace, grooviness, over and out. Enjoy your life. Live a life that leaves behind a wonderful story, and enjoy living it as the adventure that it is. Until then, peace, grooviness, over and out. Boom.